In this video, we're taking a deep dive into the history of the Latham Axial Flow Supercharger. This is one of the most fascinating supercharger systems of the 1950s and 60s, and it's also one of the rarest with only about 650 units produced. And luckily we got our hands on one of them. Not sure exactly what we're gonna do with it just yet, but it inspired this research project to find out all the details about this supercharger, what makes it cool, what makes it rare, what makes it valuable, and why everybody on the internet is fascinated by this crazy design. What I love the most about hot rods and drag cars from the 1950s is that there wasn't a set standard yet. People were still experimenting with different types of fuel, different types of forced induction. One of the things that really got a lot of traction in the 1950s was supercharging. The earliest form of supercharging came with the roots blower design. And this consisted of two rotors that basically crunch the air down into the engine and it takes a little bit of horsepower just to spin that pump, but with the right pulley combination, you can make some serious horsepower. Early on in the roots blower days, guys were using the potvin setup, which actually positioned the blower in front of the engine, and it was driven directly off of the crankshaft. So a lot of different theories on how to create the most boost without blowing the engine all to pieces. You know, that was just kind of a trial and error situation during the 1950s but eventually the blowers would be placed on top of the engine using a custom intake manifold. Krager was one of the ones that really kind of revolutionized that, making intake manifolds for all sorts of different engines to adapt the Detroit style 671 blower onto conventional V8 platforms. Also in the 1950s, centrifugal supercharging was really gaining ground on the typical root supercharging systems. And this was because these units were pretty small. They'd fit under the hood of a stock bodied vehicle and they were essentially half of a turbocharger. So on one side of the unit, it would have a propeller and on the other side, it would have a pulley that attached to your crankshaft with a belt. One of the biggest obstacles of the centrifugal supercharger is that that forced air is being pushed into the carburetor and through the carburetor, which created some fuel mixture issues especially under heavy boost pressure. But what we're gonna talk about today is a completely different concept than root supercharging or centrifugal supercharging. And this is called an axial flow supercharger. And one of the only axial flow superchargers for the automotive market was produced by Latham Manufacturing Company in West Palm Beach, Florida. This company was owned by Norman Latham and just judging by some of the newspaper articles I found, he was actually a pretty big shot there in West Palm Beach. So this guy was not just your average hot rodder. He was definitely on the higher end of the spectrum as far as money was concerned. And I saw no real reference of his hot rod influence until 1956, and that's when the Latham Supercharger debuted. According to my research, the first mention of the Latham Axial Flow Supercharger was in June of 1956 in Hot Rod Magazine. Not only did they mention, they did an eight page article about the Latham Supercharger, going into crazy detail about the construction, about the technology, about the output, about the challenges. I mean, it has everything. This is a very, very thorough article. And they actually installed this unit on a 1956 Ford 292Y block engine. Early on, most of these supercharger systems were used on American sports cars like the Chevrolet Corvette and Ford Thunderbird. But later on in the years, a lot of different applications were covered, including some European applications, a lot of higher end V8 applications for American big blocks and things of that nature. This company really seemed to have the marketing figured out. They were getting major publicity from these huge magazines. Hot Rod Magazine, the biggest thing that Hot Rods had going, they featured this thing right off the bat, June of 1956. And then there was a Latham supercharger on the cover of Motor Trend Magazine. There was articles in Rods Illustrated, Sports Car Illustrated, Speed and Custom, Rodding and Restyling. I mean, these superchargers were all over the pages of Hot Rod and Performance Magazines all throughout the late 1950s. So you'd like to think that Norman Latham, and I'm assuming he had a couple of employees at this point, were absolutely slammed just trying to get these things out the door. Because when products like this would hit the magazine pages, people would start picking up the phone and calling or mailing in to try to get their hands on one of these units. That was just how 
the hot rodding world worked back in the 1950s. So one would assume that they sold at least a couple of hundred superchargers after that one article in Hot Rod Magazine, and then more after every other article that came out about this thing. And then there was lots of race proven results. There was some pretty famous racers of the time that used Latham superchargers with great success, and they got publicized as well. So between the articles that were focused strictly on Latham superchargers and the mentions of Latham superchargers on cars like Carroll Miller's 56 Ford, which set records at Bonneville, set records at Daytona. Then you had Les Ritchie's 57 Ranchero, another influential racer that got a lot of coverage in the print magazine world at the time. These guys were running these Latham superchargers and making big gains. In an article about Les Ritchie's 57 Ranchero, it stated that his car ran a 15.2 at 90 miles an hour in stock form. And after they bolted on the Latham Supercharger, it went 13.44 at 103 miles an hour, a almost two second gain in the quarter mile, which was unheard of in the 1950s. There was nothing you could bolt onto a car and make that kind of a gain. One thing that was mentioned in almost every one of the magazine articles was the expense of this kit. It was not hidden that this was an expensive piece of machinery. And you know, it was also not hidden that it would increase horsepower, but at what cost? And I think that must have been a limiting factor on a lot of people ordering these things because to put it in perspective, the kit early on was about $500. And at that time, you could buy a brand new car for about $2,000. So you know, we were looking at a quarter of the cost of the car to add on this supercharger. And to put that into today's terms, you know, let's say you bought an $80,000 late model Corvette, that would be a $20,000 supercharger if we're looking at it on scale. So definitely a lot of money to be spending back in the day to just add a little bit more horsepower, especially in the case of these cars that were already touted as being big time powerhouses right out of the factory. So let's talk about how this works. An axial flow supercharger does not have rotors that compress the air. It does not have a propeller that pushes the air. It actually has 363 curved blades to aerodynamically compress the air in a straight line. So essentially the air comes in at the front of the supercharger and goes through several stages and exits at the rear of the supercharger in a small rectangular hole. And the particular supercharger we're looking at here is an 11 stage. You can see those numbers stamped in each ring. And that designates how many stages of those rings and blades are inside of this blower. So theoretically, with more stages, it increases the velocity of the air when it gets to the back of the supercharger. And even then, these things only made about seven or eight pounds of boost. And that was with an extreme pulley combination. So the example we're looking at today has a 10 and 3 quarter inch crank pulley, massive crank pulley. And then up top on the blower side, it has about an inch and 3 quarters of surface area on that pulley. And that ratio, which comes out to about 6 to 1 in this case, is making extreme RPMs on the blower. So these things were tested at well over 40,000 RPMs but were typically run at about 30 to 35,000 RPMs. So these things were very efficient. They only took about 10 horsepower to spin it at max boost, whereas a roots blower would take much more horsepower to make horsepower. These Latham supercharger setups used Carter YH side draft carburetors. And most of the time they would have a total of four carburetors on there. Sometimes on smaller applications, they might have two. Sometimes on really extreme race applications, they would have a total of six carburetors. So that was kind of dependent on the horsepower levels that were expected. And these things had special linkage that was made by hand. It was a really intricate setup. And you can see here how it all works. Latham gave you the option to just buy the blower and build the rest of it yourself. Or you could buy a kit for several different types of engines, small block Chevys, 409 Chevys, Ford FEs, small block Fords, Y block Fords. They had all sorts of different options for different engine kits. And most often they would use an adapter plate that would fit it to an original four barrel intake manifold. And it wasn't until a little bit later that Latham partnered with Edelbrock to produce its own intake manifold. And they only did this for the Ford FE platform. And I think that's because Norman Latham actually had an FE race engine and maybe had some buddies with FE race engines that were running them in boats. 
The kits also came with a front mounting bracket, which usually bolted to the water pump area, or maybe sometimes the front part of the block or cylinder heads, but that would support this giant chunk of aluminum because the mounting bolts on the back, that was just four bolts and studs in the middle of the intake manifold. So it needed that front support. And then it also came with a belt tensioner. It was a spring loaded tensioner that would keep that belt tight. Because if you see on these pictures, the belt actually doesn't have any grooves whatsoever. Where a roots blower typically has big, you know, Gilmer style belt. Or some of the centrifugal superchargers might have a V belt or a serpentine type belt in modern days. This thing had no grooves whatsoever. Completely flat belt, completely flat pulleys. So this was a nightmare as far as belt alignment, as far as keeping the belt tight and keeping it on there. These things were probably a headache to fool with. If you were turning serious RPMs, I would imagine slinging a belt was pretty normal. But an advantage to the Latham unit is that you could run it without a belt and it would feed through the engine just fine. There would be no issues whatsoever. Whereas a root supercharger, if you sling a belt, you're in big trouble. Another claim to fame of this Latham supercharger unit is that it increased fuel mileage significantly. Now, I don't have any real information to back that up. I just see it in some of the marketing materials and some of the magazine articles saying that this thing actually crunches up and chops up the air and fuel mixture a lot better as it goes through the supercharger and down into the engine. So, you know, I can see how that's possible, but I'm not sure how much of an increase you'd see on something like this, a, a high performance setup. I feel like no matter what, you're gonna be spending a little bit more on fuel. So through the years, Norman Latham continued to expand his operation, making kits for many different types of engines. And you can see here on this price list that it was getting pretty expensive to play the game. So a complete kit for an American V8 car you know, you're looking at seven, 800 bucks, maybe even up to $900, depending on what you're getting. And that was a lot of money back then to spend on a supercharger setup. So these things hit the ground running with a pretty high price tag in 1956. And by the mid 1960s, they were just out of sight. And at this point, there was a lot of things changing in the automotive aftermarket. There were tons of companies bringing out different products and it was really a turning point for Latham superchargers. And by about 1965, he was pretty much done producing superchargers. But Mr. Latham held on to all of his equipment for many years until he sold it to Richard Paul in 1982. Now he took all the parts and updated them and actually made a kit for GM F bodies in the 1980s. When it was all said and done after nine years of production at Latham Manufacturing Company, only about 650 of these superchargers were produced. Now, I don't have production numbers for, let's say, McCulloch superchargers or any other fancy speed parts from back in the day, but I can tell you that 650 units is a really rare piece. That's a really small number when you consider how much publicity these things got and how well they worked back in the day. So I think it really all came down to the price. It was a little bit too rich for everybody's blood during that time and it just didn't hit at the right timing in the market. And for me personally, I've been to a lot of car shows, a lot of nostalgia drag races, a lot of swap meets, and I have personally seen two of these units. I saw one on a 409 that was on a Lindwood Dragster that was amazing. It was just like, it blew me away. And it was one of the first times I'd ever even heard of this supercharger. And of course it just sends you down a rabbit hole of research. And then I saw another one in a museum. So these things are extremely rare. And I can't believe that we've had a once in a lifetime opportunity to own one of these things. So a few weeks ago, my dad was in his shop, a lot of people hanging around as they always do. And a guy stopped by to hang out for a little while and they were talking about blowers because my dad's building a 34 Ford with a big block Chevy and they're putting a 671 or an 871 blower on it and he was looking for an intake manifold at that time, so it just came up in conversation. And the guy told my dad that he had an old supercharger that he's had for 30 plus years. He bought it from a swap meet. And as they're talking about it, it was really starting to click with my dad that this was an interesting setup, not your average supercharger, because they were talking about the side draft carburetors and all that kind of stuff that really sets this thing apart. Not long after, my dad got back in touch with the guy, went and looked at it, confirmed it was a Latham, and we had the opportunity to buy this thing. So we bought it at the, I don't want to sell it price. So, you know, we didn't get it for like $200 or something like that, but it's still one of those opportunities 
that just will never happen again. We like to think that we know where every good speed part is or every good old dragster or old drag car, but they're still out there hiding. They're still in those sheds. They're still in those garages. And you know, you just never know what you're gonna come across. And when the opportunity comes up, you gotta jump on it. Not that we needed this particular one. This one actually has one of those extremely rare Edelbrock Latham intake manifolds. And it's for a Ford FE engine. So, you know, we don't really fool with a lot of Fords and we probably don't have any plans to build an FE for any of our cars, but it's just too cool to pass up. One of my favorite things about these Latham superchargers is that all of them have a plate attached to them. Now, sometimes you'll see them without the plate because the rivets get ground off or something gets damaged or whatever, but most of these things have that plate intact and that allows you to see the model number. And in our case, it's a 16A and this is an 11 stage housing. So this is the biggest one that you could get at the time. And also on that plate is the serial number. So there's only a few exceptions to this, but almost every unit started with the number 001. Ours is 001427. So based on that 427 serial number, I'm assuming that this was produced sometime in the early 60s. And the fact that that intake manifold will bolt right onto a 427 makes that serial number a pretty happy accident. I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna do with it. I think that ultimately we're not gonna build a Ford FE to put it on. Uh, we're kind of figuring out the details of that right now, but we're just happy to have our hands on this extremely special and very valuable piece of hot rodding history. Latham Axial Flow Supercharger, one of only 650 built from 1956 to 1965. This is an awesome piece, and it's just another piece of our collection of hot rod and drag racing components. And it once again sent me down a rabbit hole of research, trying to find out every piece of information I could get. So I appreciate you following along. Stay tuned for more. All right, so Curiosity got the best of me. Got me a big old socket. It's one and 16 inch. And I want to put it on here with my impact. I looked it up and this impact is good for about 7,500 RPM. So that's just barely above idling speed for this supercharger. This thing would spin up to 35,000 RPMs. So we're going to give it a go here, starting slow. There you have it, basically like a siren. And I can't imagine what this thing would sound like at full song, 35,000 RPMs. Notice how smooth that bearing is. I mean, it's just still sitting there spinning. So these things were efficient and cool and just weird as far as their design, um, but definitely makes it a very interesting piece of hot rod history.